Awesome. Well, it's great to be with you, Shoreline, tonight, whether you're joining us right here in the worship center or you're joining us online. Night of Worships has become one of my favorite things we do here at Shoreline. And it, yeah, we can clap for that. And at the beginning of the year, we started this incredible series called What's in a Name? And each month, we take a look at a different name of God from the Bible and what it means. And last month, Pastor Kevin taught on El Shaddai, which means God with us. And tonight, we're looking at this name, Yahweh Nisi, which translates to the Lord, our banner. And as we begin tonight, I just want you to take a moment just to, to think about your own life. And begin to ask yourself this question. What banner is over my life? What banner is over my life? A banner can be described as a long strip of cloth bearing a slogan or design hung in a public place or carried in a demonstration or procession. It can be very easy to replace the Lord as our banner with many other banners in our life. And for some of us, we may have walked in here and money is the banner over our life. Maybe it just has a slight grip on your life. And for some of us, pleasure is the banner that is over your life. Maybe you're just chasing after all the wrong things and you're continually coming up empty. And for some of us, success might be the banner of your life. You want to be deeply known. You want people to look at you like your life has purpose and meaning and value. And I know in my life, I chased success for a long time. If there was a banner over my life, it would, read in, it would have read in big, bold letters, success. I honestly believe that if I was not a pastor in a mega church, that I was a failure. That my, amount, that my career would amount to nothing. And so for many years, I began to chase this. And I finally began to strip down this banner. I said, God, I don't want this banner of success in my life any longer. All I want to do is live for you. I want to replace that banner with the Lord is my banner over my life. And it made all the difference in my life. It made all the difference in my pastoral career. All I wanted to do from here on out was share the gospel. I want to share Jesus with people. It didn't matter if the church was 200 or 20,000. All I wanted to do is what we call here at Shoreline, to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. But it took me stripping down that banner in my life and putting the Lord back as my banner to see God begin to do a great work in my life. So how about you? What banner is over your life? And does it need to change tonight? Does it honestly need to change tonight, November 3rd, 2021, here at Shoreline Church at Night of Worship? Does God need to strip a banner out of your life, and does the Lord need to reign over your life as your banner? Because here's what I can tell you. Your life will be richer, and you will see God-sized victories in your life when the Lord is your banner. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we jump in tonight, I just pray, God, that you would convict our hearts. God, I pray if anyone in here has a banner other than you that is in their life, that tonight it will be stripped down. God, we want to bring you glory. We want to bring you praise. And I pray that our lives reflect your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we are all going to face battles in our life. And I pray that when we're in the thick of the battle, we know that we have a God who is a banner over us. We love you. In shame we pray. Amen. Just to give you a little context of where we're going tonight, the Israelites had spent 430 years in slavery in Egypt. And Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh looks right back at Moses and says, no. And so God sends 10 plagues on Egypt. And finally after the 10th plague, Mo or Pharaoh looks right back at Moses and says, okay, just take your people and get out of here. So Moses and the Israelites begin their exodus out of Egypt and they hit their first roadblock. It's the Red Sea. And to make matters worse, they look behind them, and the, the Egyptians have this change of heart, and Pharaoh and his army is coming up behind them. And the Israelites begin to grumble and complain. They said, it would have been better for us just to remain slaves in Egypt than it would just to come out here to die. And Moses takes his staff, and he stretches it out over the Red Sea, and the waters part. And the Israelites begin to walk across on dry land. The Lord is making a way for the Israelites. And this wouldn't be the last time that he would do it. 
If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Exodus chapter 17. We're going to jump into verse 8. If you have a smartphone, if you have the Bible app, you can jump in as well. Exodus chapter 17, starting in verse 8. If you don't have either, it'll be on the screens behind me as well. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held his hands up, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. The Israelites have already seen God show up by getting them out of slavery. And now they are going to need God to show up in a big way because the Amalekite army is on the move. And the Israelites are going to have to engage in the battle. And for the Israelites, this is completely unknown territory to them. And we're going to jump in and see how it begins to all unfold. So if you have your Bible still open, we're going to jump into verses 8 and 9. And here's what it says. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. The Israelites are just getting used to freedom. And now they're on the brink of their very first fight. The Amalekites come up from behind and they attack them. And this is where I picture the Israelites with their eyes kind of wide open like this. Their jaws are probably dropped, dropped a little bit because you have to understand where they're coming from. They just spent 430 years in slavery. They're finally getting their first taste of freedom. And now they're under attack. And just to give you a little visual of what this fight is going to look like, it'd be like a lightweight boxer versus a heavyweight boxer in the ring. The Amalekite army is a force to be reckoned with. And the Israelites are about to go toe-to-toe with them. And I want to give you just a little insight, just a little background on who this enemy is, who the Amalekites are. Because the Amalekites, by all means, have the upper hand in this fight. They inhabited the land of the Negev, which was a desert region in southern Israel. And they were a semi-nomadic people. And they were also descendants of Esau. And if you know, if you're familiar about with Esau, he was a godless man. He was a man that loved the ways of the world. He was a man that loved the ways of the flesh, and he despised spiritual things. So it makes all the sense in the world that his descendants, the Amalekites, would despise spiritual things as well. And it makes even more sense that they want to wipe out the children of Israel. And as far as we know, the Amalekites never fought battles while they were in slavery. But as soon as they were out, and as soon as they had this taste of freedom, they learned very quickly that they had enemies. And the Amalekites were going to be the first to attack. And they're vicious. The Amalekites are out for blood. It wasn't like they just saw each other in the distance and thought, we're going to see who the bigger man is today. We're going to see who's tougher. We're just going to come out for a fight. The Israelites weren't looking for a fight at all. But the Amalekites attack them from behind. And they begin to pick apart the Israelites who were at the back of the march. And the Israelites who were at the back of the march were often the weakest. They were the sick. They were the weary. They were the worn out. It's kind of like a fragile bunch of people. That's who the Amalekites target first. And so you got to put yourself in the Israelites' shoes just for a second. Because they had to be intimidated at least a little bit. They probably looked left, and then they looked right with this worried look on their face, and they thought, how many of us are actually going to die today? And they probably wondered, are we going to become slaves all over again? And Moses is going to choose one guy to lead the Israelites into battle. And he looks to a guy named Joshua, and he says, you are my man to lead us onto the battlefield. And you got to ask yourself, why Joshua? What is so amazing about this man Joshua that he's mentioned in the Bible? Because this is the first mention we get of Joshua in the Bible. It wasn't like Moses just looked out amongst the hundreds of thousands of Israelites and thought, this guy looks like a quality leader. 
He looks like he's got the stature of a warrior. I think we're going to choose him. He looks like a, a great guy to lead us in battle. Here's what I can tell you. From the time they were in slavery up until this very moment, Moses has been watching Joshua carefully. And he sees this amazing leader in this man. He says, you are the guy for this moment to lead us onto the battlefield. And I want to give you just a little foreshadow of who Joshua is so you understand what's underneath the surface of this man. In Numbers 13, the 12 tribes of Israel send 12 spies out to go spy out the land of Canaan. And after they're done spying out the land, they come and give a report to Moses. And out of the 12 spies that spied out the land, only two of them came back and said, yes, Moses, I believe we can conquer the land. I believe that we have what it takes. And one of those guys was Joshua. Joshua is the man. Joshua is this guy that has this deep courage inside of him, and he believes that God can go above and beyond and that he can make a way for them. And when Moses would go on to die, it was going to be Joshua who would lead the Israelites into Canaan to claim victory. This is the guy who's jumping on the scene right here in Exodus 17 for the first time. And we get a front row seat into the beginning of the leadership of Joshua. And as Joshua begins to lead his army into battle, Moses isn't going to be going with him. Moses knows that he has to fight this battle in a very different way. But here's what Joshua knew. That when he marched in the battle, that the Lord was a banner over them. And here's what I want to tell you tonight. No matter what battles you face, whether they're small or whether they're big, you have a God that fights for you. You have a God who is a banner over your life. You are never alone. Sometimes it feels like we are all alone in the battle. And I want you to know that you have a God who is a banner over you. And as the battle rages on, never, ever, ever forget to go to the hill. Because on the hill is where we see God intercede. And here's what it says, jumping into verse 10. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So as Joshua and his men are fighting on the front lines down in the battle, Moses, Aaron, and Hur, they head up the hill because they're about to fight this battle in a completely different way and the Amalekites have no idea they're about to lose this battle because of what's gonna happen on the hill. And this battle is actually involving three things. It's Joshua and his men fighting on the front lines down beneath. It's Moses, Aaron, and Hur praying for God to intercede on the hill and it's the power of God in the heavens. But I wanna focus on the hill just for a second because you have to understand and grasp the importance of what's happening on the hill. As Joshua and his men are trusting God on the front lines, Moses, Aaron, and Hur are trusting God to intercede on their behalf. Because here's what Moses knows. Moses honestly knows that they do not possess the skill set to win this battle against the Malachites. They actually don't have it in them to win this battle on their own. And what I love about Moses is that he's wasting absolutely no time to start praying. He recognizes that he's going to have to go to the hill and ask God to begin to intercede on their behalf. And it was customary for the Jews to lift their hands when they prayed. And since Moses held the staff of God in his hands, he was confessing complete and total dependence and authority on the power of Jehovah. It wasn't Moses who was empowering Joshua and the army below. It was God Almighty. And as long as, jo as, long as Moses held his hands up in the air, the Israelites would be winning. But any time that he would lower his hands, the Amalekites would be winning. So if I'm Joshua and I know this is happening, it's like I'm looking up there saying, hey Moses, do whatever you can to keep your hands up. When your hands are up, we're winning the battle. Do whatever it takes. Just don't lower your hands. But there's gonna come this moment where Moses begins to grow weary and tired and he can't keep his hands up any longer. And when I think of the situation that the Israelites are in, it makes complete sense to me that Joshua and the army would grow weary as they're fighting on the front lines. But Moses, like Moses up on the hill, like what is happening up there that you're growing so weary and so tired? You see, he was interceding in prayer on their behalf. And when you pray without ceasing, it becomes incredibly exhausting. And we get a glimpse of this as Jesus prays in the garden of Gethsemane before he's crucified. He's praying with such intensity that he begins to sweat drops of blood. And Moses is up on the hill praying with that same type of intensity to the point that he's growing faint. 
And he will not be able to keep his hands lifted without the help of Aaron and her. So I just want to pause and ask you this question. When Satan is attacking you from all sides, what is your first reaction? Do you fight alone? Do you stop and pray and ask God to intercede knowing that he can come to your rescue? Because here's the truth. You have a real enemy who is out to destroy your life. It's not a matter of if battles are coming your way. It's a matter of when battles are coming your way. And it can be extremely easy to forget to head to the hill. But I want to encourage every man, every woman, every student that is in here to head to the hill. Head to the hill and pray for your marriages. Head to the hill and pray for your kids. Head to the hill and pray for your pastors. Head to the hill with every battle that comes your way because you have an enemy that wants to take you out. But don't step back. Don't put your head down. Do the very thing that Moses did and head to the hill and ask God to intercede. I'm incredibly grateful for the people that went to the hill to pray on my behalf. My grandma Maggie was one of those women. She's now in heaven with Jesus. But at 14 years old, she came up to me and she said, Brandon, I just know at some point God is going to call you to be a pastor. And I said, Grandma, they don't make a lot of money. I don't, I don't want to be a pastor. That was not even in, like, it wasn't even a thought process for me. And she prayed for me and she prayed for me. And even when I had two years of walking away from Jesus, or if the banner over my life in those two, two years would have read culture and pleasure. And she prayed and prayed and prayed. She was on the hill praying and praying for God to intercede in my life. And God interceded in my life and changed my heart. And I've now been a pastor for 15 years, and I love it. And now I have such a passion to, I have such a passion to go to the hill to pray for people as they're fighting their battles. And as Moses is on that hill, and as exhaustion is setting in, you're about to find out the importance of friends on the hill. When you are too tired to keep your hands up, you are going to need friends on the hill with you to keep your hands lifted. We know that Aaron and her went up the hill with Moses, and now we're about to see the importance of why they went to the hill. Here's what it says in verse 12. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and her held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. You just got to let this picture just sink in for a moment. Moses is growing so tired that he can no longer even keep his hands up. It's like his hands are just kind of making their way down like this. And, Mo, and Aaron and her are going to come to his rescue. They put this stone underneath of him. Aaron goes to one side and he grabs him like this and he kind of braces his arm and he holds his arm up. Her goes to the other side and he grabs his other hand and he braces it and he puts his hand up like this. And they keep his hands steady until sunset. There's not one single person in here that can fight battles on your own. There's going to come a point where you're going to grow weary and you're going to grow tired and you are going to need people in your corner. So the big question I want to ask you tonight is, who is on the hill with you? Who is on the hill with you? Because without the support of solid friends in your life, it's going to be tough to keep your hands lifted. We've been in one of the craziest seasons of our lives. 20 months has gone by of being in this kind of, this COVID situation. And for many of us, it's felt very isolating. Like community's been really tough. And at Shoreline, consistent community is one of our seven spiritual markers. And consistent community is just fellowship within the church. And Shoreline's all about growing together in healthy relationships. And I want to encourage you to continue to dive in because the more you engage in consistent community, the more you're going to realize that you have a family who is for you. You have a family that loves you. You have a family that will be your pillars when your strength is not enough. So who's on the hill with you? Are you all alone? If you're all alone, I want to encourage you to find at least a few people to go to the hill with you who will lift your hands up when you have nothing left to give because we weren't meant to fight this, our battles on our own in this Christian walk. Each and every person in here needs somebody on the hill with them. It's really not an option. And when you feel like you don't have the strength to carry on, you are going to need those friends to be your pillars and to hold your hands up when all you feel like doing is giving up. Lock arms and fight battles together. When you lock arms and fight battles together, you're better together. And together, we see victories. And that's the last piece of the night is the victory. And here's what it says as we continue on. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it 
because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. The Israelites just witnessed a miracle. And it would have been super easy for them in this moment just to high five each other, to hug each other, to point to each other and say, it was because of you this victory was won. Joshua, it was because of you down on the front lines with the sword in your hand and you did a great job. Hey, Moses, it was great that you were up on the hill praying and asking God to intercede and Aaron and her and lifting your arms up. And it could have been super easy for Moses to build this monument of himself. He could have built a monument for Joshua. But he was very quick to give credit to God. He said, we need to build an altar. And we need to call it, the Lord is my banner. Yahweh Nisi. And I want you just to think about the cross for a moment. The cross where Jesus bled and died and gave his life for us. So that we could have life and have it to the full. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And after he conquered the grave, he went to the right hand of the throne of God where he's seated. God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to intercede on our behalf so that we can have new life. Our banner is a blood-bought banner. And I want you just to pause and think of that for a moment because Pastor Dennis is gonna come up in a little bit here and lead us in communion. And it's a time of us where we just get to reflect as we hold the bread in our hand on Jesus' broken body and his blood that was poured out for us and the banner that we have over our life is a blood-bought banner by Jesus on the cross. And every person in here, I can guarantee you this, when you walk out of this room tonight, you are gonna fight battles. You are gonna face battles, and I wanna encourage you, make sure you head to the hill. Make sure you head to the hill and make sure that you have people that will be on the hill with you to hold you up when your strength is not enough. And on the flip side, you are gonna have to be the person that holds somebody up when they don't have the strength either. And together, when you fight together, you see victories. And make sure you slow down and say, God, it's because of you intervening in this moment that I saw a victory in my life, that he is a banner over your life. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. And I pray now, as we get ready to partake in communion, Jesus, that you would just let us reflect on on you Jesus, it was was your blood that was poured out on the cross that gave us new life and set us free. And so, Jesus, I pray right now that we would begin to strip banners down in our life. If there's anything that anyone walked in here with tonight that is not of you, God, I pray that they would strip that down. And I pray that they put you as the Lord over their life, the banner over their life. And, God, I pray that we would always want to run to the hill God, we are all gonna face battles when we walk out of here. But God, I pray that we can go to the hill to ask you to intervene so that we can see victories together. And I pray that we have friends in our corner, that we have consistent community. When we don't have the strength to carry on, God, I pray that we have friends that will be there for us, to be our pillars. Jesus, we love you. And it's in your name we pray, amen. It was a time of Passover where tens of thousands of people by tradition and law would come to Jerusalem, as Jesus had done as a little boy. And now he and his disciples have entered this city, and they go to a room to have a meal, which we now call the Last Supper. And in that supper, he does something very different and very special with bread and with wine. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And in a few minutes, we're gonna share that very special thing together. It's called communion. It's a time of remembering him. So, and and those of you online, get your elements ready. I wanna just prepare you. You've been given a cup when you came in. It has two lids. The little top one, and I'll tell you when, not yet. The little top one, you pull it and you get a wafer. And then after that, you pull the second one and you get the juice. So 
we're asked by Jesus to do this in remembrance of him. And we are people who need to remember, don't we? We are blessed by remembering. We are impassioned by remembering. We are encouraged and we are enlivened by remembering. That's part of what we do. And Jesus knows that, of course, and that's what we do tonight. We remember. These are the reasons that we take communion. We remember Christ who willingly died on the cross to take away our sin. We remember to proclaim his death. We give heartfelt thanks for his willingness to die in our place so that the price of our sin is paid for. And then as we begin to pray and we feel the music and all that, we also, you may just look within and we maybe close your eyes and ask yourself some questions like this. Am I holding any grudges against someone? Is, is there that, that wall between us? Or, or do I know of someone who's holding a, a grudge against me? I encourage you to pray to have those walls removed, those grudges removed and swept away. We ask the Lord to cleanse and forgive. And we remember that we're communing here as brothers and sisters and together with those of you online. And what we're doing is connecting to those disciples and all those who had communion throughout history to remember. That's what you're doing here tonight. And we acknowledge our covenant, the new covenant with Jesus Christ that we are now in as believers. And lastly, we eagerly anticipate his return. Oh, he's, he's coming back. It's a promise that he's made. If you're here tonight and you're not yet a believer, communion at this time won't be for you, but we're really glad you're here, really glad you're here. And I, I ask you to just watch around you and see what it's like as people partake of the bread and the cup. And I ask you because Jesus' arms are open wide. Anytime you're ready, he's ready for you. And he welcomes you. He's not willing that one should be lost. He loves you. He loves you very much. So how does communion work? I'm going to read to you from the book of Matthew, chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he gave thanks, he drank from it. And he said, this is my blood poured out for you. It's poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So I ask you now if you would Take your bread. And join me. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. drink from it, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you, the blood of the covenant. Join me. Would you pray with me? Thank you for giving us this, Jesus. Thank you for this sacrament that we can pause and remember who you are, what you did and what you do now because your word says you are in us and we are in you. 
thank you. We are grateful. We have new life. We have a hope. We have a plan for our life. We have things that you've created in advance for us to do. Help us do them well. Help us, help us do them in a way that brings you great honor and glory, Lord. We thank you for this time. Help us sweep away anything we're holding against anyone right now. Just move it out of us and just, just feel that cleansing that comes with it. Help us repair whatever we need to repair as we go forth tonight for your sake and for our well-being. For this is something that pleases you. And we thank you for this. So, Father, you touch each person's life here tonight. Be with them. Thank you for them. Thank you that you know them and love them. And we pray this in the very precious name, Jesus, your name. Amen.